The most popular alternative to the Darwinian view is called creationism. Creationists believe that designoid objects are really designed objects. The only difference is that whereas these designed objects were designed by humans, these designed objects were designed by a divine creator. And the favourite argument of creationists is the so-called argument from design, which was most famously expressed by Archdeacon William Paley in 1802 in the book Natural Theology. And Paley begins his book, In crossing a heath, suppose I pitched my foot against a stone and were asked how the stone came to be there. I might possibly answer that for anything I knew to the contrary, it had lain there forever. In other words, the stone is the kind of object which had always been there and doesn't need any special kind of explanation. But, Paley goes on, what if I accidentally kicked a watch? The watch, I open it up, I see the mechanism, I see the cogwheels and the springs, everything about it looks designed. It had to have a designer, it had to have a watchmaker. And if the watch had to have a watchmaker, then how much more, Paley argued, must these objects, these living objects, including ourselves, have had a, a divine watchmaker? For Paley, it follows as clearly as the night follows the day, that just as the watch had to have a designer, so do we have to have a designer. But of course, just to show that animals and plants look as though they've got a designer, begs the question, I spent much of this lecture trying to persuade you that animals and plants look as though they've got a designer. But I spent the other half of the lecture showing you that there's a, another very good alternative explanation for why they look as though they had a designer, namely natural selection. Well, Paley, of course, lived before Darwin, so he couldn't be expected to know about the alternative. Nevertheless, it was, even without knowing about Darwin, it was possible back in the 18th century to know that Paley's argument was a pretty bad argument. And this was pointed out by David Hume, one of the greatest philosophers of all time. Hume made the point that the argument from design, which, is, which was Paley's argument, is that things like elephants and humans are too complicated to have come about by chance. They have many parts just like a watch. Too complicated to have come about by chance. A designer, a watchmaker, an engineer, is certainly one way in which these objects could come about. These objects could come about. But a watchmaker or a designer or an engineer, if he's to be any good as a watchmaker or an engineer, must be a pretty complicated object himself. It's no good just postulating a designer, because a designer is just the very kind of thing just the very kind of complicated, ordered thing that seems to need the very kind of explanation that we're searching for. If a human is too complicated to have come about by luck, or if a swift is too complicated to have come about by luck, then a thousand times more so, any being capable of creating humans must be too complicated to have come about by luck. The argument from design certainly proves that living things couldn't have come about by chance. But by the same token, even more strongly, it shows that a divine creator couldn't have just come about either. The creator would have needed an even bigger creator, and so on. The argument from design is a powerful seeming argument, and it powerfully shoots itself in the foot. The Darwinian argument of evolution by natural selection, of course, doesn't suffer from this problem. The Darwinian argument does not explain things as due to chance. Chance, in the form of random genetic mutation, comes into it, but by far the most important part of the Darwinian explanation is the non-random process of natural selection. There's another rather interesting little curiosity, which is that natural objects, designoid objects, have imperfections which you, don't, you wouldn't expect to get in objects which were designed by a real designer. <coughs> this is a flatfish, a halibut. Its ancestors once swam normally in the water like a normal fish does, like that. But the ancestors of the halibut settled down on the bottom of the sea, one side down. 
They lay on the bottom of the sea, and then now a modern flatfish moves along like that. You've probably seen them doing it. But when it did that, the ancestor found that one of its eyes was looking straight into the sand. Only the other one was looking up. And so gradually in evolution, the other eye, the one that was looking into the sand, migrated round the side of the head and came up to the top, with the result that the skull of the halibut is now an extremely distorted object. It's like a sort of Picasso painting of a fish. It's got its two eyes on one side. Now, anybody who was going to design a flatfish wouldn't do it that way. You'd do it like a skate, which is another kind of shark, which is also a flatfish, and it flattened itself, its ancestors flattened itself, by going onto its belly, so that both its eyes were looking upwards, and it had no need to do any kind of distortion. But by some kind of historical accident, the ancestors of the halibut and the soul and the place all did it by lying on their side, and that meant that they had this distortion. So this is an imperfection in design, which is just the kind of thing you'd expect to see if these creatures had evolved, but is very much not the kind of thing you'd expect to see if these creatures had been created. Evolution starts from simple beginnings. The starting point of evolution is the kind of thing we see here, something like crystals, something at least as simple as crystals. And it builds upon simplicity to, to get towards complexity. We start with a simple foundation. Simple things are easy to understand. We don't have to start with a complicated thing like a creator. On this simple foundation are built designoid objects by natural selection. And only when we have designoid objects with brains as big as human brains does design finally emerge. But why do I say just humans for design? Isn't it rather unfair to the wasps that built these pots and bees and spiders and things, rather unfair to this oven bird that built that mud nest, or that nest of social wasps, which is very similar to that, convergently, also built of mud. Why do I use the word design only for human creations and not for the manufacturers of these animals? The difference is that human designs get their goodness and efficiency from conscious human foresight. Wasp pots and oven bird nests get their efficiency directly from natural selection by a kind of hindsight rather than foresight. <coughs> Genes are selected which influence the bodies of the oven bird and the wasps and particularly the nervous systems which influence the building behavior. The <coughs> birds and the wasps have no idea of why they're doing what they do. Natural selection simply favors those that build good nests. Humans, on the other hand, do build with foresight. At least they do usually. This is an engineer called Ingo Reckenberg from Germany who designs windmills and he claims that he designs his windmills by a kind of natural selection. Uh, he does it by putting his windmills in a wind tunnel, measuring how good they are, and then, as he calls it, breeding from those windmills that are good at spinning around in a wind tunnel. The windmills have genes, and again not real genes, but they are numerical attributes, they're numbers that are used to make other windmills that resemble the parent windmill. And in every generation of windmills, he breeds from the ones that do best in the wind tunnel. And after many generations of testing them and breeding, testing and breeding, he ends up with a windmill that he claims is better than you would get by the ordinary processes of engineering design. But you could say that all engineering design and even all art has a certain Darwinian component. And I want to illustrate this with another computer program uh, called Biomorphs. So can we have a volunteer to run the Biomorphs? Oh, dear, dear, dear. Right, yes, please. Uh, what's your name? Rachel. Rachel. Have you ever used a mouse before? Yes. Good. Um, now, there you have some Biomorphs. Try, try one of those now. What she's doing is guiding the evolution of biomorphs. The biomorphs are controlled by genes just like the arthromorphs and just like the spider webs. And uh, they're coming up with, by random mutation, but the direction of the evolution is being guided by the human eye, just like the direction of breeding cabbages or dogs. But in this case, we're just looking for pure aesthetic appeal, just looking for the prettiest ones. And I think you might imagine breeding wallpaper or bathroom tiles or something like this. 
Okay, thank you very much indeed, Rachel. But in any case, in any case, all creation, all design, all machines and houses and paintings and computers and aeroplanes, everything designed and made by us, everything made by other creatures, is only made possible because there are already brains put together as designoid objects. And designoid objects come about only through gradual evolution. Creation, when it does occur in the universe, is an afterthought. When creation appeared on this planet, it came locally and it came late. Creation does not belong in any account of the fundamentals of the universe. Creation is something that, rather late in the day, grows up in the universe. Thank you very much.